This is the company that killed Osama bin Laden. In this video, I'll be talking about one of the most prominent growth stocks that could easily grow in multiples within the coming years. If you want to find out what exactly this company does and why I'm so bullish on it, make sure to stick around until the end of this video. So what exactly is Palantir? The best way to put it is that it's a big data analytics company. They get massive amounts of data that governments and private firms don't know what to do with and draw meaningful insights that can help with business. And yes, it is said that this company helped track down bin Laden, but the company never formally admitted anything. Palantir's founder is none other than Peter Thiel. During his PayPal days, the company faced a crisis due to a scam led by a Russian mob. And because of this, PayPal started nurturing groups of experts who could track and predict scam transactions. They developed a software that analyzes data patterns which allowed them to identify and prevent these schemes. Peter Thiel thought that this software could potentially be used for many other things. With this, he managed to convince Joe Lonsdale, Stephen Cohen, and PayPal engineer Nathan Gettings to join the team. Then he got Alex Karp as the CEO of the company. Peter Thiel knew Alex since their days at Stanford. So Peter Thiel sold some of his PayPal shares to invest $40 million into Palantir, establishing the company in 2004. Palantir aimed to design a software that could collect and analyze data to ultimately make predictions. Now they positioned themselves very well because they targeted governments as their main initial customer. Softwares like these require at least a year or two for development, as well as a lot of money in R&D. So having entities like the CIA as our client was a better option than having other private companies that want a fully functioning product immediately. Also, in the case of the CIA, they had collected a tremendous amount of data since 9-11, but they weren't really sure of how they could utilize this to catch terrorists. So the CIA becomes Palantir's first client, and Palantir receives an investment from InQtel, which is the venture arm of the CIA. With the CIA support, they develop a software called Gotham, which allows Palantir to analyze huge data sets in real time and visually demonstrate the result of the analysis through connective relations and patterns. Gotham became recognized as the best analysis tool that the government has seen and later became used by the CDC, NSA, FBI, and the Pentagon, as well as the Marine Corps. This software is used to track suspicious activities and the flow of potentially illegal funds, as well as tracking missing children or the spreading course of a disease. With this experience in technology, they worked with JP Morgan to develop a new software called Foundry. Foundry is a solution for private firms that analyzes data to prevent financial fraud or legal transactions. Now, this may all sound really complex and it may be hard to comprehend, but here's an easy way of understanding what the business does. In the fourth industrial revolution, a lot of data will be produced and companies that are capable of processing tremendous amounts of data will be on the rise. These companies will have to go beyond just analyzing patterns and interpreting data to be able to make predictions with high probabilities. So let's take a look at how big the market for big data analysis can grow. The green bar represents the market size of big data and analytics. In 2017, the market size was about $120 billion, and it grew to $172 billion in 2020 with a compound annual growth rate of 11.9%. Let's take a look at the S1 that Palantir submitted to the SEC before it got listed. They estimated their total addressable market in the commercial sector as $56 billion and the government sector as $63 billion with a total addressable market combined of $100 19 billion dollars. The good news is that there aren't any other companies that can replace Palantir and take U.S. government departments and agencies as their client. However, the total addressable market of $63 billion includes other countries abroad as well, and there certainly will be countries that will be reluctant to give away precious data to an American firm. Palantir is a government-friendly company, so they only do business with the United States and its allies and countries that share the same liberal democratic values, which is why their addressable market does not include countries like China and is limited to $63 billion for now. Then we can take a look at the commercial sector, and we can see 
that Palantir's market share in the commercial sector is not as impressive. Of course, this is data from 2017, so considering that Palantir's revenue in 2020 is double that of 2017, we could estimate that their market share has grown over the years. This graph demonstrates the actual unique selling point that Palantir has over its counterparts. The darker the shade of blue, the more advanced they are. If we look at Palantir, their strengths lie in predictive analysis, interactive data visualization, and analytics platforms, as well as geo-intelligence. Palantir is still a growing company, so they don't cover a whole lot of fields like other tech giants here on the list. But from another perspective, you could say that they're focusing on their strengths. But for Palantir to really grow, it seems like diversification could be a strategy to consider. So let's take a look at Palantir's financials. If we look at the quarterly income statement, the gross profit has dropped significantly in Q3 2020 from the 70% range to 50% range. This is due to the compensation provided to the company's employees through company shares, which I'll cover later in this video. Just to tell you the conclusion first, it's not that the business structure is eroding in which the cost of the revenue is actually increasing. Then we can take a look at the R&D expenses, and this has also increased significantly in the same quarter as well, and this is also due to the stock-based compensation that they're giving out. Regardless of this outlier, Palantir is a company that invests a lot on research and development. They are spending 30% of their revenue on R&D every quarter. And as you can also see, Palantir is still technically not a profitable company as their operating income is in the red. Let's take a look at their Q4 2020 results. Last quarter, they did $322 million in revenue, which is a 40% increase compared to the same quarter last year. In 2020 total, they did a little over a billion in revenue, which is a 47% increase compared to the revenue in 2019. Looking at the average revenue from Palantir's top 20 customers, the revenue increased 34% compared to last year, marking $33.2 million. And the average revenue per customer also increased by 41%, marking $7.9 million per customer on average. This could be interpreted as a sign that Palantir's clients are happy with the service they get. And in 2020, the revenue they generate from governments increased a whopping 77%, marking $610 million. In 2019, the commercial revenue covered 53% of the entire revenue, but in 2020, the government revenue outweighed the commercial revenue in terms of proportion as it covered a little over 60% of the entire revenue. The commercial revenue, on the other hand, wasn't as impressive as the government revenue as it only increased 22% compared to that of last year. Now, there are both good and bad news that come with this. Personally, I think the increase in revenue from the commercial sector is important for Palantir's future growth. But at the same time, the fact that a huge portion of their revenue is reliant on government money indicates that this company could survive a bear market and generate consistent revenue from a client base they have monopoly over. So let's get back to the operating losses. This page explains why Palantir's operating loss was much larger in 2020 compared to last year, despite their significant increase in revenue. As you can see, it's actually for these three reasons that Palantir ended up with an operating loss on their income statement. The stock-based compensation, payroll taxes related compensation, and non-recurring direct listing charges. If we actually don't take these into account and look at the adjusted operating income, Palantir ended up with an operating profit. If you look at this, you can understand that they've diluted the stock-based compensation expenses in different ways. It's included in the cost of revenue, sales and marketing, R&D, and general and administrative costs. Let's look at the cash flow statement and go over some of the most important points. Their net cash used in operating activities is still in the red, but it's definitely continuing to improve as we compare it to the numbers of 2019. Also, the amount of cash and cash equivalents they hold is a little short of $2 billion, indicating that they have plenty of cash. Now, keep in mind that we want to be rational optimists when investing our precious hard-earned money. So it's only fair that I also go over some of the concerns that you guys might have over this company. Before I do so, please make sure to like this video for the YouTube algorithm. Please just do it right now before you forget. So Palantir went public via direct listing or a DPO, and their lockup period expired on February 19th. 
This basically means that insiders were only able to sell their shares starting that day. It's also important to take into consideration the fact that insiders had been holding the stock for much longer than we think. For instance, Matthew Long, the general counsel at Palantir, sold over $20 million worth of Palantir shares that he had. And while this may seem like a pump and dump scheme with insiders cashing out their bags, it couldn't be further from the truth. For instance, Matthew Long has been holding Palantir stocks since at least 2013, according to the SEC filing. And seeing that this date back to 2011, the employees that are selling today have been holding the stock for over a decade. Also, Palantir has a very unique governance structure in which they have three types of shares, class A, B, and F shares. The sell-off is happening with other class shares as class F shares are owned by Alex Karp, Stephen Cohen, and Peter Thiel, essentially granting them complete control of the company. Some people might say that this isn't an investor-friendly governance structure, but given the sensitive nature of the work they do and the data they process, I personally think it makes sense to run the company this way. So just because insiders are selling their stocks doesn't necessarily indicate that they're cashing out and even giving up on ownership and control of the company. Another concern might be that Palantir lacks revenue from the commercial market, and that might be a legitimate concern, but they are working on a solution to this issue as well. They recently bought on dozens of sales staffers to pitch their new product to other firms. So Palantir isn't a perfect company and does pose certain points that may be of concern to certain investors, but on a fundamental level, there really isn't much to be worried about. Now comes the million dollar question. What is the proper valuation of this company? How much is this company worth? In other words, what is the appropriate price of the stock? Since this company isn't valuable yet, let's first take a look at some of the stats related to their revenue. If we look at the EV to sales ratio, Palantir's number is at 31.76, when the median value is at 4.49. The price to sales ratio is at 32.84, while the median value is at 4.3. If you look at this, it might seem like Palantir is just extremely overvalued, but don't be too hasty with your judgments yet. Let's take a look at a comparison of Palantir's number to that of other counterparts. Here we have other big data analytics companies like Splunk, SAP, IBM, Altrix, and Talend. If we look at the PS ratio of these companies, Palantir is a dominant first at 48.07 with Altrix in second place at 15.35 and Splunk at 11.77. So now's the time to get critical. We understand that Palantir is pretty overvalued compared to its counterparts, and it's important now to figure out reasons as to why this may be the case. They have monopoly over government contracts, and they do have cutting edge technology that is arguably the best in the industry. But how much more revenue and profit can this company really generate compared to other companies? What I personally like to look at are indices that demonstrate profitability and scalability. The forward expected revenue growth for Palantir is 35.65%, which is much more than that of its counterparts. So let's take a quantitative approach in valuing a company that has tremendous growth potential but isn't profitable yet. I would like to say that this is not financial advice, but rather a way to educate you all on how to calculate the fair value of a company in a certain way. There's a way to use the PSG ratio to calculate the value of high growth momentum software stocks. So the idea of a PSG ratio is similar to the price to earnings growth ratio or PEG. The stock trading at a PE ratio of 20x with an expected earnings growth of 20% is set to have a PEG ratio of 1. Similarly, a stock trading at a PS multiple of 5x with expected sales growth of 10% has a PSG ratio of 0.5. This is a graph that lists a number of software stocks according to their PSG ratio. We have the PS ratio here, and if we divide that by the year over year growth, we get the PSG ratio. The higher the PSG ratio, the more overvalued the stock is. So if we look at an example on the list like Zoom Video Communications, their PS ratio is at a whopping 92.3x, but if we actually take into account the growth of this company, they end up with a PSG ratio of 0.49, indicating that the stock is relatively undervalued. So going back to the example of Palantir, the revenue growth for Palantir is at 35.64, and if we rearrange the formula, we get this.
The PS ratio is equal to the PSG ratio multiplied by the revenue growth of the company. So to make an assumption on an adequate PS ratio, let's go back to the chart we just saw and take the median value of all companies. The median value is about 0.72. So if we multiply the PSG ratio, which is 0.72, by the revenue growth rate, 35.64, we get a PS ratio of 25.66x. Of course, using just one index for growth to assume the multiple for the PS ratio is a huge leap forward because if we compare another index like the gross profit margin, Palantir's profit margin is around 64%. And there are other companies that are much more profitable, like AYX, for instance, which has a gross profit margin of 91.55%. So the point is that you shouldn't just blatantly trust my calculations or assumptions, but try to think of the most accurate way to approach it. Going back to the calculation, we came up with 25.66x for Palantir's PS multiple, and we can apply this to Palantir's revenue. Analysts expect Palantir's 2023 revenue to reach $2.14 billion. So if we apply the PS multiple to this value, we get $54.91 billion for the market cap of this company. When Palantir's stock price was at $29, the market cap was at $43.85 billion. So if we place the $54.91 billion here, we get $36.31. This is what it means. If we assume that Palantir does $2.14 billion in revenue for 2023 and apply a PS multiple of 25.66, the price of Palantir stock should be around $36.31 in 2023. Given that Palantir maintains the current PS multiple of 34.19 in 2023 as well, we can come up with an even bullish case where the market cap reaches $73.16 billion. Calculated the same way, this gives us $48.38 per share. So based on this calculation, if you are willing to invest in Palantir for the next two years, Given that you enter right now at $24.19, you could expect a return between 41.3% to 100%. Now, as a trader, I also like to take a look at the charts to assess whether this is a good place to enter a position for an investment. We can see that the price has retraced over 61.8% from the all-time high levels, indicating that $22.69 was a great place to enter a position. We managed to secure the support in that price level, and Elliott Wave counts also suggest the bottom is probably in. In case you don't know what Elliott Waves are, basically it's a theory in technical analysis that price moves in waves. So a complete structure would look like this. It would have a five wave structure, one, two, three, four, five as impulse waves moving up, and then a corrective wave structure, ABC, moving down. So here we can see the five blue lines that move up and the smaller lines that are constituents of the bigger trend. In the case of Palantir, I would say that we have completed this part of the structure. If we look at the technical indicators as well, the relative strength index has been flushed out and is trading near oversold levels, and the moving average convergence divergence, or the MACD, has formed a golden cross and is forming small bullish histograms. So the technicals tell me that a buy near $23 is probably the best place to get in and that the stock has massive upwards potential even from the perspective of technical analysis. So let's do a quick summary of the entire thing. Palantir is a company that is in an increasingly growing industry but is reliant on government contracts for the time being. While this means that they are a monopoly in some way, they also have to set their strategy to target commercial clients in the coming years as well. Their cutting edge technology has been approved both by government and commercial clients and justify the growth potential of the company. Using simple assumptions to apply the PSG ratio in calculating the fair value of the company, we can estimate the stock to reach between $36.31 and $48.38. Given that the stock is currently at $24.19, this is the 41-100% to upside. Technical analysis also aligns with the bull case of the valuation, indicating that the stock has recently been oversold and that an entry around $23 would be reasonable. So that is it for today, guys. I hope this video was helpful to you. If you liked this video and found it to be helpful, please make sure to drop a like. It really helps me a lot and motivates me to make quality content like this. If you have any questions or comments, make sure to comment down below. Don't forget to subscribe for future content and I'll see you guys in the next video.
Thank you.